So I've been telling you about this book, which I got to give you credit right off the bat. Uh, I remember we had a conversation years ago. When was it? One of your Bible studies, like when uh-huh. I was like 19 or something. And you were like, man, I just want to read some really good books about like men. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, and then you were like, like Teddy Roosevelt, like that guy seems like super like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and that planted the idea in my head all the way back then. And then eventually I was like, I, I don't know. I can't, I, I think I heard about something Teddy Roosevelt had said and I was like, I need to do that. Yeah. And, then, and you've done it and I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but the book that uh, we're going to talk about is The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt by Edmund Morris, um, who sadly died this year. Edmund oh, Morris. man. But I think he was old. I don't know. A little, si- little side topic real quick. Yeah. Not really a topic. Mm-hmm. Just a question. Because you, you've picked a few biographies mm-hmm. to buy or you have bought mm-hmm. from Barnes & Noble. One thing that kind of holds me back from buying biographies is not knowing what author to trust. Yeah. Because like they're writing about someone else's life who they more than likely didn't know. Yeah. I don't know. Just just a yeah. question that I run through my head, like, how do I know which biography to buy? Yeah, well, the well, I, I ended up getting six books for my birthday on Theodore Roosevelt. And okay. I just took the list. Um, another book here is The uh, the Art of Manliness right over here. Mm-hmm. The author of this has a website. And for Father's Day in the past year, he uh, recommended, like, books on Theodore Roosevelt for that would be like great Father's Day gifts. And I looked these books up and they are uh, revered by just about everybody as far as their historical accuracy and okay. their research and that sort of thing. And it is hard like, you know, to, to – because like sometimes they're just fanboys. I mean like, yeah. you know, if you read a biography on Bill Clinton that's written by like a Democratic strategist, uh, you're probably not going to get the full story. <laughs> Maybe not. Um I, I was in uh, Half Price Books the other day, and I saw uh, his autobiography. It was called My Life, Bill Clinton. I'm like, yeah, there's going to be some details left down there. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> most likely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it is hard because you don't know, uh, especially, you know, there's so many different people that write books. And it's like somebody can write a very compelling book, mm-hmm. but is it true? That's right. what really matters. Um, and there are bestsellers that are historically inaccurate. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Uh, from what I looked into this book and the subsequent two volumes of this uh, book, because this only covers his like first 40 years of his life, right up until he becomes uh, president. Okay. And then the next book, I think, covers his presidency, and then the following book covers his like later life. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I found out about this list from the Art of Manliness website. Um, Very nice. And I got this book. The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, and I got to say, dude, I cannot recommend this book more. Um, it's long. Yeah. Uh, it's like 800 pages, um, but it's really well written. Like, it's not hard to understand. It's very easy to read, um, but it is long. Like, lots of times the chapters themselves took me over an hour to read, just like one chapter. Um, <laughs> there are there are page breaks, so if you don't want to read the entire chapter in one sitting, that's nice. fine. That's nice. There's lots of page breaks, but most of the chapters take a while to read. Um, but, yeah, reading this book, this is like I, – one of the things that like uh, – and we'll probably talk about this later. Uh, men need – I think it's pretty clear from like all of data and history, men need good role models. We need yes. like a North Star to follow. Uh-huh. Um, and reading a book like this, well, Theodore Roosevelt like wasn't perfect in every way. Sure. For his time, he was about as close to perfect as he could possibly be. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, and reading just even at him as a kid and in like early adulthood, all that like he was like reading it made me just like when I woke up, I'm like, it's like, you know, like what would Jesus do? Yeah. I was also saying like, what would Teddy Roosevelt do? Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cause it's the guy, he was, he was like, uh, he, I mean, he really was like when you hear about like uh, great men of history, mm-hmm. you know, usually something comes out about him that wasn't so good. And sure. yes, there are a couple things in here that weren't so good given the nature of the culture that, in fact, kind of shaped him mm-hmm. that he also went along with. Like he had some, he had some very weird views about race, mm-hmm. and, and that like in some ways, like he. What's crazy is, is in the 1880s, 
he nominated a black man to be the chairman of the Republican National Convention, which was insane to do. Yeah. But at the same time, he wrote books where he talked about the lower races and stuff. And so it was like, yeah. it, it was, he had weird, like, well, he was simultaneously like really forward thinking. Mm -hmm. But he also, I think, whenever, I also think he had lower expectations for people that were not white. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a weird thing. And I, I don't know what, I think maybe his opinion evolves later in life because mm -hmm. um, it hinted at that in this book. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, he like he wasn't perfect in every way. But for the time, even what I just told you, like that was incredibly progressive for the time. <laughs> yeah, very. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, like just reading him, like I I'll, I want to read you a couple like short little snippets about him. Yeah. Uh, like. He was the man. Like, mm. he really was. When you look at, like, a, you, historical role models, like, pretty much universally, everyone who met him, everyone who encountered him, they pretty much all universally were like, even if they did not like him, they were all pretty much like, yeah, he's kind of the most impressive person we've ever met. Right, <laughs> like, yeah. Like, even his enemies were like, yeah, I can't stand him, but, you know, he does kind of do... More than anyone, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. and and he like is uh, he can't be bought. Like Bram Stoker, the guy who wrote Dracula, uh, had dinner with him once because t t Teddy Roosevelt just he was one of those people where he could simultaneously hang out with like backwoodsmen and then uh -huh. also hang out with high intellectuals. Uh -huh. And he had dinner with Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula, and Bram Stoker wrote afterwards in his diary, "This man must be president." He cannot be bought, cannot be control, cannot be cajoled. Uh, he must win. It's something like a man. I can't remember what the final thing he said, but basically he was like, uh, "Must be president." <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, Rudyard Kipling was another author who met him, and Rudyard Kipling described it like in uh, they would go to these like science clubs and mm -hmm. discuss science. And one of the things about Teddy Roosevelt is early on in his life he was like super into natural history and animals and he, I mean he was into it all his whole life but mm -hmm. initially that's what he wanted to be and when he would visit like the science these like science clubs even like well into his like 30s and 40s uh, people were amazed that he would walk in he'd see a disassembled skeleton assemble it and then he'd tell them all these facts about this particular animal its behaviors all these different things and Rudy R. Kipling once described how he just sat back in his chair curled up his legs and just watched as uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, spun the world, and he like, and he was the world spinner because like he just was like he was an avalanche of personality yeah. right in front of you that he was undeniable, <laughs> like, and like everyone described him that way. Um, but yeah, uh, he and like his morals were pretty much like yeah, you couldn't early on as a politician, people tried to bribe him, mm -hmm. tried to get him. He didn't unflinching. care. Yeah, he was unflinching. Like he went after a year. He was an assemblyman in New York, and as he was an assemblyman in New York, his first year there, from what I can remember, he went after a New York Supreme, a New York State Supreme Court justice for uh, corruption for helping this big business, this railroad, like take out competition and he went after these people and like <laughs> as an just, assembly man yeah as an assembly man like first year there like he just like went after them unflinching he almost got them taken down but as it turns out these people actually bribed other men in his con and in, in his uh i can't remember what the other assemblymen and he was not able to uh, prosecute them but uh yeah he was unflinching uh all the stories you hear about him hunting and stuff like they're they're insane. He actually killed a ridiculous amount of animals. <laughs> it's 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 kind of insane reading the stats, and uh, he always separated himself from like the trophy hunters and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But you could argue that, as the author in this book argues, while he didn't like just kill animals and take their skins most of the time, he kind of killed so many animals that it was almost like he was doing the same thing. <laughs> trophy like he just he just like. He'd go out and kill like three elk and like he'd go to gather the meat and you know like uh, uh, but yeah he was um, a man like him is gonna use that yeah, meat yeah though, he I, used I it yeah he did he, he didn't just um, kill it leave it for dead no he just, just he detested tro trophy uh, hunters yeah. from what I could remember reading but um but yeah he uh, 
he was ruthless. He just had like this bloodlust inside of him. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. And um, but yeah, I could not recommend the book more when it came to like his personal morality. He mm-hmm. had like a great dad. And his dad proved that, yes, the children of uh, sometimes, Mm -hmm. if properly raised, the children of very wealthy parents can be great men. Yeah. Uh, His dad proved that because the Roosevelt's were already rich by the time uh, Teddy came came along. Mm -hmm. But his dad – let me see if I can find it. Um, His dad, Theodore Sr., he, uh, his dad, Theodore Sr., was the kind of guy who would say, because uh, he had both boys and girls, uh, he said, uh, his dad said, um, the same standard of clean living uh, is demanded for the boys as for the girls. And uh, what is wrong in a woman cannot be right in a man. And that was what his dad kind of was like. He, mm. he was very, uh, very disciplined. He disciplined his children, made sure they were, uh, I think he said, uh, you put your morals first. Your uh, and, and your morals first, and your career second. It was something. It was it was one of those I am third things. Yeah. But uh, it was morals first, family second, career third, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, his dad was uh, a great man, and uh, he was. You that's what, obviously that's usually a common thing uh, among like great great men of history. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had a great person who came before them. But um, yeah, and. You know how we were just talking about like how I like uh, like super manly stuff. And yeah. Like, uh, you know, like I've told you about it's like movies like Braveheart and. Oh yeah. Like I just there's like there's like this thing inside me where I just like I want to consume information about like just like the archetype. Heroes. Of, yeah, yeah. Heroes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, reading the um, reading this book, it became apparent to me that me as a child, that Teddy Roosevelt as a child. We're like the same person, but he was about a hundred times more impressive than I ever was. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the same. Yes, yes. Nonetheless, the same. But like he was like super in. Like he, there's a he was like, I actually think that he must have had some sort of slight brain difference in him, like maybe some very, very, very mild form of autism mm-hmm. or something, because it was insane the amount of energy he had while he had like chronic asthma. Hmm. And, like, he just got so many things done and consumed so much information that I'm almost like, like, he must have had something. Because, like, it's just when you – I'll read you a passage here from when he's, like, uh, assistant secretary of the Navy, mm-hmm. things he did in 21 days. And it's like, how in the world did somebody do how that? How are you that productive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but he was like me in that he also uh, – he he just he, he he just wanted to join that group of men of like of great men like heroes and this mm-hmm. was something that he wrote about him as a child uh, he wrote i was nervous and timid yet from re- yet from reading of the people i admired ranging from the soldiers of valley forge and morgan's riflemen to the heroes of my favorite stories and from hearing of the feats performed by my southern forefathers and kinsfolk and from knowing my father i felt a great admiration for men who were fearless and who could hold their own in the world and i had a great desire to be like them like that's that's like that's why i'm reading the book (laughs) Um, (laughs) because i have a desire to be like yes yes uh you know and it's uh yeah, the guy – there's a hilarious story, though, like, on that. Like, because I – when I was a kid, like, I was – I wasn't into, like, dissecting animals. He would do that. He yeah. was really – he was a weird kid. Yeah, that's borderline um, psychotic, like, but like, he, he would stayed just, on the good He would go side. out and, like, kill birds, dissect them for his Roosevelt's Natural History Museum that he <laughs> started room. when he was, like, nine. Yeah. yeah. And his – but there was a story. Like, he would leave animal parts throughout the house in, like, different drawers and his mom freaked out at him at one oh, point. Yeah. And she threw this dissected animal he'd put in like the kitchen drawer. <laughs> she threw it out the window. And he said, but mom, the loss to science. <laughs> the loss to science. And, and, oh. it, and it was just like he was uh, – and I, I can just imagine, like, he just didn't understand. Like, why are you doing yeah. that? But like, That was mine. Like, he was crazy. Um, but, he's, <laughs> you know, he was great. Um but yeah, just like, uh, and I I don't want to touch about it on on it too much. But I will say that there is a part. There's a chapter in this book that made me cry so badly. Mm. I, do you do you know what happens to his first wife at all? 
Uh, I do. I think. Do. I think. Didn't she and and his, first his born, mom? Oh, his yeah. mom passed yeah. away at the same time. Yeah. So what happened in this chapter? Because I did not know this, and so when this happened, and then I read like the things that he wrote in his journal afterwards, mm-hmm. I just like just started bawling. Um, but I basically what happened to his first wife is she had just given birth to their first child, right? From what I can remember, and he got a telegram. He was in New York working in the government. And he got a telegram, and at first he was celebratory. Then he got a telegram like two hours later, and he just got immediately gone got on the train to New York. And um, when he got there, his mom was incredibly ill, was going to die, and his wife had gotten uh, some sort of disease associated with childbirth. Mm-hmm. And so he went up to spend time with his wife, and at 3 a.m. in the morning on Valentine's Day, 3 a.m. in the morning on Valentine's Day, he was told to come downstairs to say goodbye to his mom. So he said goodbye to his mom. And then he spent the rest of the morning and the afternoon with his wife, who died at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. Within 12 hours. Yeah, 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 in the same day. And then in his journal for that day, he drew a giant X or a cross, something, and he wrote one line in it, and it was, the light in my life has gone out. It was the, like, in reading that, and then he also wrote, like, in his official, like, like uh, eulogy or something, it was, like, even more just heartbreaking. Mm. Um, and also, like, the way his dad died, luckily he was there to say goodbye to his mom and uh, wife. Did his dad pass before his, his mom? His dad had passed years before. Okay. Um, but his dad had passed. Uh, Teddy had gotten a telegram again that his dad was dying. Mm-hmm. He got on a train. When he got there, his dad had died. Um, before he had even shown up. Um, but yeah, the guy had experienced great tragedy. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, yeah, but that part of the book, I swear, even just like, I swear, like if any, any, any of you decides to read this book, uh, if you don't have any ounce of emotion come out of you, then I don't think we can be friends. <laughs> yeah. um, Which that that's a that's a point that I think is worth noting. This yeah. is the manliest one of the manliest men in history, mm-hmm. known recorded history, mm-hmm. and he is willing to express the pain and the emptiness that he felt. Yeah. When I mean anybody would be sad. Yeah. You'd be you'd be sick if you're not sad about something that drastic and that you know just traumatic happening all in the same twelve hours, but. He didn't just feel the sadness, he expressed it. And mm-hmm. I think that's something just noteworthy for everyone that a real man is going to be willing and yeah. able to express that sadness. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, and it's it's sad because, like, his uh, – it was – because, like, the way it was – like, he ended up dealing with his grief. It took him, like, a year or a year and a half to get over it. But it was like he just uh, – he just tried to whatever he could do to not think about it, but it would just in moments like he was on a hunting trip with one of his friends, and just out of nowhere he just started crying. Oh and yeah, said, my grief is not healable. It was just like oh, it's just mm. oh, it's horrible. But um, but reading that, and coincidentally that day my brother Austin uh, almost died, Whoa. and so I got a phone call after I'd read this horribly tragic chapter. Uh, and it sounded like my parents were emotional. I was like, oh, no, please, no. Yeah, no. What happened was my brother, Austin, he was changing the oil on his car. And yeah. this, the jack slipped out from underneath. And he was, uh, like, crushed under the car. He didn't in, have, have any actual injuries. But okay. his face was turning this way, so his face wasn't smashed or anything. But uh, his girlfriend, came, luckily, came out and had the sense to jack the car back up and got, got him out from underneath. Oh, but, thank God. Yeah. That would have been like... That's horrifying. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if <laughs> I remember thinking, I was like, I just read this, the saddest thing I've ever read, and then like if my brother dies, <laughs> you know, that's just like... You would have been on emotional overload Yeah, at that I would have point. been like, what is happening? What in the world, you know? Um, and it would must also, to anybody, uh, regarding like women, like loving women, like... What he wrote about his first wife is like uh, in his journal from whenever whenever he like first like asked her to marry him, and she said yes. He wrote in his journal, "It is the goal of my entire life to make her happy," mm. and so 
So any husbands out there just want to <laughs> want a dish cleaner, think again. <laughs> That's right. It's not cool. No, it's um, not. But uh, yeah, yeah, and like I, I can't go through everything because uh, it would be a very, very long time. But uh-huh. um, yeah, the guy. I mean, dude, he was police commissioner of New York. What? Um, yeah, and I didn't when know he was, that. yeah, he was also like a sheriff. And when he in Dakota, a deputy sheriff, and he ended up arresting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was also ended up he ended up arresting two guys who stole one of his uh, his like uh, canoes, <laughs> and uh, he and his buddies uh, that were living on the Elkhorn Ranch in the Badlands, um, mm-hmm. they made a raft and they sailed up river like a hundred miles, and they caught these guys and then brought them into town and got them thrown in jail. That is like, utter determination. <laughs> up river on a raft for yeah, a canoe. Yeah. 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 And uh, they were. Yeah, they they were insane, and uh, yeah, um, also like, yeah, but like him as a police commissioner, he didn't. He was only police commissioner for about a year or so, and then he accepted a job as assistant secretary of the navy. Mm-hmm. But um, as police commissioner, he shaped, he got New York into shape very quickly, as as, as in shape as he could get it, because right. it was the government was corrupt enough he couldn't fully fix it but yeah. he did a lot and including uh he would go out at like 3 a.m in the morning to make sure that patrol officers were doing their jobs and he would just be wearing a top like a regular hat and coat and mm-hmm. just show up and if they were sleeping he'd wake them up <laughs> <laughs> get back to work yeah yeah that's awesome yeah yeah um but that's yeah awesome. he yeah and like when it came to like uh marriage he was like he he waited until he was married uh when it came to sexual relations, mm. um, one of the few men of history that did. <laughs> um, yeah, that we that we know of for yeah, sure. Yeah, that we know of. I mean, granted, a lot of that was more of the custom back then. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But even then, like when he was at Harvard University, because he studied at Harvard, um, it was still like the culture was obviously not as uh, not as liberal as it is today right. regarding that. But it was still like a lot of his friends did that yeah um, but he didn't he was unflinching when it came to that um uh yeah and there's even a story of when he was a politician in new york in his 20s i believe where um he was uh politics was just as dirty as it is today they were just more clever about it back then and less less publicity less obvious mm-hmm. about it um there was a story where uh he was walking home one night in new york and this woman fell down in the street in front of him, and he helped her up. And he uh, he was like, uh, you know, he offered to. He called over like a you know cabin horse, and um, but she was begging him, begging him to come home with her. And he was like, this is weird. Yeah. So what he did is he paid for her cab and sent her sent her on her way, but he took note of the address that she was going to, and he hired a private investigator to go investigate that address. And as it turns out, some of his political opponents had, they were their intention was for him to get in that cab with that woman. They were mm-hmm. going to either try and take a photo of him with this woman or what, there were apparently a whole bunch of men waiting at that house that very well may have beaten the crap out of him. Mm-hmm. To, to, just to take to, him out of the to, race. Yeah, to just stop, to, to just, you know, intimidate him into capitulating yeah. to all their schemes and everything. Threaten them with blackmail, or threaten him with blackmail, or whatever. Um, but yeah, um, and the only other, uh, you know, there's a couple more things I'd like to talk about. <laughs> but and then, yeah. then we'll move on to some other stuff. Yeah. But uh, again, I, this is like five percent uh, of of what this uh, of what this uh, book is about. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, I cannot I cannot recommend it more. Um, but I w- I do want to read this very short paragraph about when he was on. Elkhorn Ranch in the Badlands, there was a man named E.G. Paddock, who was a pretty violent dude, who was upset that uh, Teddy had claimed the land of Elkhorn Ranch, and this E.G. Paddock guy was basically saying, no, he can't have that, and mm-hmm. if he doesn't get off, I'm going to kill him. And as soon as his, so Teddy Roosevelt's ranch hands told him this as soon as he rode into the ranch. Yeah. And so what he did is immediately, I'm reading from the book, Remounting his horse, he rode back <laughs> upriver to Paddock's house at the railroad crossing. The gunman answered his knock, and then, I understand that you have threatened to kill me on sight, rasp, rasped Roosevelt. 
I have come over to see when you want to begin the killing. <laughs> Paddock was so taken aback, he could only protest that he had been misquoted. Next morning, Roosevelt left for New York, confident that from now on, his ranch site would be left in peace. <laughs> like, 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 that's just like, like that's the amazing. guy, yeah, he just, he just like, immediately, he was like, uh, <laughs> Immediately you know what? remounting yeah. his horse. Yeah, 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 he was just like, you know what, this guy doesn't, you know, this guy's not, uh, he needs to know mm -hmm. I am not to be messed with. And can you imagine that? You threaten somebody to show up at your door and they're just like, let's go. Let's yeah. go. Let's do it now. When's this <laughs> happening? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. That's hilarious. <laughs> but, yeah. Did not shy away from conflict. No, he did not. No, he did not. Um, uh, and there's also a, I don't, I'm not going to read it, but he almost got mauled by a bear. Uh, he ended up yep. killing it, but uh, <laughs> it charged him and he had to dodge it and stuff. I have so, heard that story. Uh, yeah, and the only other passage. Uh, oh, yeah, there's also a story where. Okay, so he was in the Spanish American uh, American War, uh -huh. in the 1890s, and um, he did really well in the war. And what's interesting about him, one of the big flaws that cited about him is that he was kind of a warmonger, or he just mm -hmm. always wanted to go to war. Mm -hmm. And he was constantly criticized about it for most of his early career. He was criticized for you don't know what war is like, so why why are you constantly wanting to go to war? And, well, what ended up happening is he eventually went to war. Mm -hmm. And he did really well in war, actually. He became, uh, I just finished a chapter on it. Um, he did, he was, like, incredibly heroic. Um, mm -hmm. And so he proved himself in that way. Still, uh, reading his attitude towards war, I'm like, dude, you're still too gun ho A little too, <laughs> little too yeah. giddy to kill. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're too, yeah. You're, you're too, uh, yeah, you just... No, we don't need to go to war with everyone when we can. Okay? Right. Like, you, no. Um, but there was a story from they had basically taken over Cuba because uh, that's where the Spanish-American War mostly take, took place because the idea is Spain was occupying Cuba and America wanted to free Cuba. Yeah. Um, and we basically won. Um, and he decided with he and one of his friends, they would go down and they would take a swim. In the uh, in the ocean to check out this wreck, this uh, shipwreck, and as they were swimming, there were sharks swimming swimming around them. And uh, the person who was like, there was a person who was on land who was yelling at them, "Sharks! Sharks! Like get out of the water!" And Teddy Roosevelt was like, "Oh, they they don't attack anyone." He just kept swimming, swam to the wreck, and his friend, the account is like of his friend. His friend was like. Uh, I tried to act like I was looking, but I was really more just uh, terrified. <laughs> yeah. And but Teddy Roosevelt was just looking over the ship, you know, checking it out. And then they swam back, and the sharks continued to swim alongside them and and and, and uh, circle them. But Roosevelt just never—he was just like, "Oh, they don't attack me. Yeah, <laughs> they don't attack. The chances not that he's me. Yeah, not yeah. me. <laughs> no way. Um, was con he was he was convinced that. He believed the statistics, I guess, that, like, man, sharks don't really attack people that often. Yeah. He's not going to attack me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. But That's yeah. awesome. It's just another crazy story. And then the only other thing I wanted to read um, is about his productivity. Um, oh, yeah. So as uh, assistant secretary of the Navy, he was uh, – his big thing is he wanted to build the Navy up to where – and he was wise about this, and he pr it, it and served him well later when he ran for president because he was totally right that America mm -hmm. should always be ready if there's a war. Build up our military as best as we can so that way if something happens, we can immediately respond and we can immediately, you know. And so he wanted to build up, build up the Navy. But um, <laughs> he was uh, – <laughs> He he was initially he was assistant assistant secretary of the navy, uh -huh. but the actual secretary of the navy was going to take a vacation, and so he was acting secretary of the navy, mm -hmm. and this is what he did in three weeks. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh man. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll start off. His industry during that first month confirms Henry Adams Adams's remark: Theodore Roosevelt was pure act. In just 22 days of official duty, he managed to write a report of his tour of the naval militia, inspect a fleet of first and second class battleships off Sandy Hook, expedite a stalled order for diagonal armor supplies, devise a public relations plan for press coverage of the forthcoming North Atlantic Squadron exercises, set up a board to investigate ways of relieving the chronic dry dock uh, shortage, introduce a new post-traitorship system, weigh and pronounce verdict upon the 
the Brooklyn Navy Yard probe, surreptitiously backdate a Bureau of Navigation employment form in order to favor a protege of Senator Cushman Davis, extend his anti-red tape reforms to cover battleships and cruisers, eliminate the department's backlog, backlog of unfulfilled appointments, draw up an el- elaborate cruising schedule for the new torpedo boat flotilla, settle a row between the bureaus of ordnance and construction, review the relative work programs in various Navy yards, draft a naval personnel reform bill, and fire all Navy Department employees who rated a sub-70 mark in the (laughs) semi-annual fitness reports, all the while making irregular reports to the vacationing secretary in tones calculated both to soothe and flatter. I shan't send you anything unless it's really important. (laughs) 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 Like, (laughs) that's what he... Like, the guy, like, that's... That's what I thought. Like he just had like a ridiculous amount of energy that I will never have. <laughs> I, I don't even know what probably ninety percent of those things yeah. that he accomplished really are. But I know all of them take time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have and really to. hard work. Yeah, <laughs> it's almost like he had been just plotting and planning his opportunity to take care of all these things, and as soon as he got the chance, it was like okay, game time. Yeah, he kind of was because he like. Uh, yeah, he kind of that kind of was his thing where he he was like hoping, hoping and praying that the yeah. actual secretary would take leave mm-hmm. um, or would go on vacation. Um, and so as soon as he got that, you know, that got that chance, he used it. But <laughs> yeah, like the I'm, I've got like three chapters left in the book. But uh, as soon as you finish, mm-hmm. I would like to read that. That that may take me a year to read, but I'll probably buy you a copy. It's only like half price books. I got I got. Two volumes for my brother in Austin, uh, or my brother and Ki- my brother Kyle in Austin. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, I was like, you guys need to read this book. <laughs> they may or may not read it, but uh, I'm sure I could get you like a cheap copy or something. I could probably find one at half price books. Yeah. That's a fantastic bookstore. Yeah, that's actually where I got their volumes. Uh, I bought the two last volumes that they had there at the time, but they'll probably restock. Um, but yeah, my overall review of The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt is like one of my favorite books. Favorite nonfiction books I've ever read. Um, very big impact on me in the last number of weeks and months I've been reading it. It yeah. is long, though. Um, but, uh, yeah, and I can't wait to read the subsequent two volumes. And I also have a book about some Amazon journey he did after he was president where he almost died. Like in the I've Amazon. heard of that one, yeah, too. Yeah, like, you know those most interesting man in the world commercials? Oh, yeah. Those were about him, really. <laughs> yeah. They say they're about Ernest Hemingway. No. No. Okay. I sounds, mean, Ernest Hemingway did some cool alley. stuff, but he was not, not like this. He's no um, Teddy Roosevelt. Mm. I know nothing about Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> yeah, me neither. <laughs> me neither. Yeah, honestly, I really shouldn't have said that. But. <laughs> <laughs>